But just to be honest, we can't find who's supposed to read Scripture today, so Doug's going to do it. Philippians chapter 2, let me get there. It's the New Testament. All right, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Oh, oh, oh wait. I missed two parts of it. But <laughs> emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There it is. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Let's stand as we sing the great Redeemer.
Good morning, church. The church says, great to see you this morning. We're going to get right to it. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Topic this morning is submission, or as I've entitled it, I surrender all. This is typically not a title or a topic that we enjoy discussing. Submission, surrendering, really is not in our DNA very much, particularly in American DNA because of our emphasis on rugged individualism and going our own path and doing our own thing. Being able just to surrender, being able to submit to other people is sometimes quite difficult for us to do. And according to the personality types, we're learning all about those things in the Enneagram on Wednesday nights. Some personality types, like mine, for instance, makes it even more difficult to do this. But this is a thoroughly biblical topic. Scripture from beginning to end has much to say about submission, about surrendering all to God, surrendering all to Christ, about submitting even to one another. And within the biblical picture of who God wants us to be, unless we have the ability to surrender and to submit, then we will quite never be that person that allows God full access into our life, into our heart, to transform us. You might think that's a pretty strong statement, but in fact, it is a true statement that we all have to come to a point at some point time in our life where we really truly surrender our will to God's and to let him rebuild us and remake us in his image and then that becomes a lifetime of surrendering and being remade and being transformed as we grow in our relationship with him and so while it might not be a topic we like to discuss or even find very easy to do according to scripture being able to surrender to God is prerequisite for our relationship with him and being made in his image and his likeness. And the way I want to illustrate this is look at one guy's life. And this guy is someone you're quite familiar with, and his name is Paul, as in the Apostle Paul. And I want to read you a text that's very personal from him that he wrote to the church in Philippi because of a context that was going on that he had to address in that church, which I'll mention in a minute. But Paul was a guy, personality-wise, when we look at the big picture of what's revealed about him in Scripture, that surrender probably wasn't very easy for him. But here's what he wrote in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start to give you a little context in chapter 2. He said, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glorify in Christ Jesus and he put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, the Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and in so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now before we speak of the context, I want to mention again the personality of the Apostle Paul. He certainly was 
in his life before he met Christ on the road in, as revealed in the book of Acts in two or three places. As his former lifestyle, he certainly was not a man who seemed to have surrender in his vocabulary. He was, as he mentions in this text, a Pharisee. He was, in his career choice, uh, within the context of Jerusalem, the Jewish religion, the rulers of the synagogues, the Sanhedrin council or the ruling council within the Jewish community. Paul was a young gun who was creating for himself quite a reputation, leading persecutions against Christians. He was very well educated. He was a man whose trajectory within that small context in that day was going up. Uh, and so when he writes in the text that he gave all things up, he did give up quite a bit. Now, I want to emphasize that because we can gloss that over. Paul gave up quite a successful career trajectory. He gave up potentially very high position within his context in Jerusalem. He gave up also potentially great wealth, which would have accompanied all of that in his setting in his day. So Paul was a guy who was targeted to be a great success, a young man who no doubt had big things in store for him. We could translate that over in numerous kinds of ways in whatever career choices that we might choose today and training ourselves, doing all that we need to do, greasing all the wheels, making all the connections, using all of our talents and all of our gifts to climb the ladder. Whatever it is that we might be involved in. Climbing that ladder with other people looking at us and saying, this young man's going to go far. Great things are in store for him. Paul's profession happened to be the theology and religion. And it put him in direct contact and in direct opposition to the rise of Christianity and the message of the, of the gospel of Christ. And so when he met Jesus, whom he persecuted when he met him face to face, and then he realized who Christ was, then it put his world in a, in a tailspin. Basically, meeting Christ undermined all of Paul's presuppositions. Everything that he thought he believed, and what he thought his life was going to be about, and how his life was going to be defined, was turned upside down when he met Jesus that day. And so... When Paul speaks in context about I gave everything up, everything changed, all that I thought I wanted to do before I met Jesus is now totally transformed after I met him. I want us to understand how true that was and how great a sacrifice or a surrender, if you will, Paul actually made. As he said, for his sake, I lost all things. And he did. He lost all things. Now, why is he saying this in this context in Philippians chapter 3? Well, he's saying it because of legalistic teaching in the Philippian church by Christians of Jewish background who are trying to enforce law and performance-based religion on Christians who had been set free from that by the grace of God. And so these guys were infiltrating the church in many places. In Philippians here, they were there, and they were bragging about their their resume about all the things that they had been able to accomplish through keeping the law and how Christians continue to need to do that. And they were kind of bragging about that. They're, they were speaking about circumcision, which was a Jewish custom, trying to enforce that upon non-Jewish people and all of these things. And they were making out like this. These were the, the, the height of someone's relationship with Christ. And so Paul had to go in then and he would say, look, I know where these guys are coming from. And actually, if you want to compare resumes, theirs doesn't hold up. If, if you allow me, I'll go back and tell you who I was before I met Christ. And therefore, I can tell you why what they're trying to sell you, you should not buy because of what it produces. And so he goes in, the mutilators of the flesh, meaning those who are trying to enforce circumcision, and he said, look, I've got the resume that will out-resume theirs. But you know what? That doesn't matter anymore. 
because it's not that kind of lifestyle to which God is calling us. And so he goes in then and begins speaking about losing all things, giving up all things, so that he might attain the promise that Christ has given of, of, of eternal relationship, of the power of the resurrection. And Paul said, I'm not there yet. I'm still, I'm still striving. I'm still straining. I'm still going. I'm not there. But look, it's the process. And then in this process from where I was, which was that law-based system to where I am, which is in relationship with Christ, knowing who he is, suffering with him, living with him, in that process, I surrendered all. I gave it all up. I lost all things. And he uses a, a terminology, he said, I count them rubbish. Well, quite honestly, that word is a very, in, that word rubbish is, that is translated in our English, or dung, which may be translated in some of yours, is exactly that. He, gave, he, he looked now at all the things that he had valued before. All of those things which were on his resume. All of those things that he was striving to have and to accomplish in his life. To be that person who he wanted to be then. Now that he was in Christ Jesus and surrendered his will to the will of Christ. He realized that all of that put together and more had zero value. Now I want you to understand what he's saying. I want you to get the, the depth of this. He uses the word dung. He uses a colloquialism really for waste, the strongest that you can imagine. Because he wanted to emphasize that. He wanted his readers to understand how worthless all of that that he hung his hat on before was in comparison to what he had attained and was striving to attain in Christ. Now from a, from, from a secular perspective, it doesn't make any sense. It would make no sense whatsoever for Paul to give up a potential, say, Fortune 500 kind of lifestyle to be persecuted and to travel around and to feel the burden and the weight of the churches that he had planted and to give up so much to proclaim the gospel of Christ and live a life of hardship when prior to that he had a life that was anything but. And so from a secular perspective, even in the context of the Philippian letter with those who were influencing the Philippians, to, for Paul to do what he did was quite radical. But he wanted the church to understand that it was quite powerful and it was quite liberating that what he had done, and now that he could look back on all of that and compare the two, the, the prior lifestyle that he surrendered was completely and totally a pile of dung. And he chose those words quite specifically because that's repulsive. It's something that holds absolutely no value for us it is something that we want to avoid and to handle away from us. It's not something that we're going to collect. It's not something that we're going to be attracted to. It is repulsive. And so Paul is saying to them, that lifestyle that I chose before without Jesus is quite repulsive to me. It has zero value. There's absolutely nothing there in comparison to what I have attained and what I'm continuing to strive to accomplish and have and realize in Christ Jesus, there's absolutely nothing there that has any value at all. And so when he said, for whose sake I lost all things, he lost them, but he realized in that surrender he found a victory. So you see Paul's attitude. Here's this guy, again, who certainly was... Uh, someone in which surrender was not easy. I think about, what was it, in Acts 23, even after he became a Christian, when he was, uh, come, came face to face in the synagogue after he was arrested and all these things that happened, and he got struck on the face. 
you know, Paul bowed up immediately and said, you, who are you, you whitewashed? You know, he called him a name. You know, he's ready to go down. I, you know, I'm a Sanford and Son fan. If you don't know who that is, ask your grandparents. You know, and I, I'm seeing Paul starting to get Sanford on him right there. You go hit me, we, we fixing to go. Right? And then he realized it was the high priest. But that flash, that moment that is recorded for us in the book of Acts of, Acts of Paul getting his, getting his back up against somebody in his face indicates to me that this was a guy who could bring it. And we know that he persecuted Christians and he seemed to have no problem with that before he met Jesus. And so Paul wasn't some little measly guy who was just easily manipulated, who would just kind of go with the flow so that uh, he wouldn't offend anybody and whoever he was with, that would, who, that would be who influenced him. He wasn't that guy at all. He was a very strong-willed kind of man. And so for him to, to make this transition and think about those three days that he was there after he met Jesus, Acts 22, before a man named Ananias came and, and spoke with him, those three days Paul was blinded, what he had to be thinking about his life before he met Jesus and what it meant now and, and all of these things, this whole transition period. But you see, he gave it all up. He surrendered all because he realized what was in front of him with Jesus far outweighed, far outweighed anything else that came before. And so we have an example of Paul surrendering all and becoming the man of God that he became and we're still talking about him to this day because he's made that kind of eternal difference. Now I want to look at someone who's quite the opposite just to give you a point of reference. And that's the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. If you're not familiar with his story, this is a young man who was wealthy, who came to Christ, and they had a conversation. And he was asking Jesus, what more do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus spoke some things to him about some of the commandments. And the young man said, I've done all of those since I was young. And then Jesus said something quite radical to him. And he says, go sell all of your possessions. If you really want to take hold of eternal life, you go sell all your possessions and you give that money to the poor. The rich young man could not do it, Scripture says, because he had great possessions. Now, before we go further here, it's easy to get jump on rich folks here. Uh, but in reality, and, and rich folks, I found out, are people who have more than we do. Isn't it right? It is, Right? Rich folks are folks who have more than I do. If you have more than I do, you're rich. Well, I'm here to tell you that everybody sitting in this room is rich. If we want to make some comparison to third world countries and places where I've been, I probably spend more money on my grass per year in my yard, getting it treated and mowing and doing everything that I do, than some people in the world have per year. And so, you know, it's easy for us to look at all the rich folks, oh, how evil and terrible they need to, no, we're all there. And furthermore, when you look in the story, I don't know how rich this young man was, but when you look in the story, there's more going on than just the fact that he had some money. The whole conversation with Jesus reveals a self-reliant attitude that this, this young man had. Now, it might have been based on the fact that he did have money, but it was a self-reliant attitude where he said, I've got this. I've kept all of these commandments. When you read it, and study it, you kind of get the idea that he was coming to Jesus sort of be, to be affirmed. So Jesus says, you're a good young man. Go on, go on and, and keep doing what you're doing. But Jesus, in, in, the, in the conversation, challenged him. He hit at a point to where, at the point in that young man's life, where he, sort of like Paul, had to come face to face with some things. That he had to really dig down deep within his heart to see who he really was and what he really valued, what was most important to him. Again, radical. Go sell it all. I mean, what if, Jesus, what if we met Jesus and he said the same thing to us? Whatever our all is, he came to us and said, you've got to get rid of all of it. I wonder how we would respond to that. But Jesus did that because he knew that was the point in which that young man's life, where he had to come to grips with something here. Am I going to rely on self and what I have and my gifts and my abilities to earn money or whatever that brings or whatever I can do for myself? Am I going to rely on that 
or am I going to give it all up for Christ? I mean, in, in reality, it was the same kind of situation that Paul found himself in. It's, it's a comparison here. It's looking at things and what do I value the most and what do I really want to accomplish with my life? What is it that drives it? What is it that is most important? And if I realize it is Christ, can I really surrender all? That's, again, not easy for me. I am a guy who doesn't even like to ask for help very much. I'm a guy who wants to, to rely on myself. I mean, I got poison ivy, right? And I didn't, you know, I'm thinking poison ivy, no big deal. Never had it before. And so I'm going to take care of it. I went and bought some generic something that, you know, anti-itch cream and put on there. And I said, I got this. It'll be gone. And then it just kept on getting worse and worse. Terry said, go to the doctor. I said, what does the doctor know? Sorry, Joel. You know, spent 10 years of their life. What do they know? They don't know anything. I got this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy, if a bone pops out in my leg, you know, Terry said, you got to go to the doctor. I'll pop it back in and wrap it with duct tape. Now, I'll complain about it. Man, this hurts. Go to the doctor. What does he know? I'm going to take care of it. So it's not easy. And I get it. I, I see myself in all of these texts. It's not easy. What would I say if Christ came and said, sell it all? Or some other radical challenge to my life that he knows. I need to, to uh, he's going to hit me at a point that he knows is going to open me up to the kind of decision that he wants me to make. So you have these two examples here. One guy, Paul, who said, I surrender all. My life is now drastically, dramatically transformed because I looked at what Christ offered, and then I looked at my lifestyle before Christ, and I concluded that lifestyle before Christ has taken me nowhere. Yeah, it might have been taking me somewhere from some measure, but in eternal perspective, it was taking me nowhere. And the rich young man then, on the other hand, said, well, I want to do some, I'm doing some good things here, Lord, but that's one step too far. I want to feel good about my goodness. I want to feel good about my performance, that I'm keeping some rules and regulations, but I'm really not going to go the next step and open up my heart and my life completely and totally from you. I'm going to compartmentalize that. And he walked away sorrowful. Which is us? I mean, this is how I read text when I read it for myself. Who am I in this scenario? We must surrender all. We had a scripture reading from Philippians chapter 2, one chapter before Paul's statement. And in Philippians chapter 2, the scripture reading there reveals the significance of how surrendering all helps us become others focused. Because in that reading in Philippians chapter 2 is some of the most challenging reading, I guess, in the Scripture. Some would say almost impossible to do. How can we consider others more significantly than we consider our own needs? How does that happen? I mean, just by nature, we're considering our needs. By nature, it's not really natural for me to look upon other people's needs more than my own. So this text is challenging. Again, some would say, I can't do that. I'm just being honest. It's impossible for me. But of course, the gold standard in the text is Christ. And that is who Paul brings up, having been found equal with God. He gave it all up. He submitted himself to the cross. He learned humility and obedience through the things which he suffered. And so you have the gold standard of Jesus here, Paul putting up before us, saying the reason why Christ was able to do what he did as a human being, just like us, is because he surrendered all. He, let, he surrendered the position of heaven, equality with God, found himself, uh, he didn't think that was a slight, became like a man, he surrendered it in order 
that he could consider others significantly better than himself, us, those others, which then would allow him to be obedient to die on the cross. And so you see, surrendering in this context then is the way that we become others focused. It's the way that we can become obedient. That's another word that we don't use. I've never used that word in marriage ceremonies, for instance. It used to be love, honor, and obey. That word's long gone. It's, a, it's almost now a word that's not even in our vocabulary. But you see, it's here in biblical vocabulary. Jesus learned to obey how? Because he surrendered. He submitted his will to the will of the Father. Totally and completely. He didn't hold out. He didn't hold back. He didn't compartmentalize. He didn't do any of those games. He just simply surrendered, gave up. And now Paul says in this context, if we ever are to become others focused, then it's only going to, ha- only going to happen when we have, as he says in this text, the mind of Christ. So you see, surrendering transforms us into a person God is going to be able to mold. When you think about the potter and the clay analogy, mold, make, you know, the clay surrenders to the potter, all of that image is in there. And for us to become molded by God, then we've got to be like the clay and just surrender in his hands. And when we do, then things will start changing dramatically and drastically what we value, what we think, you know, I really value this. This is the most important part of my life here. This is what's going to give me identity, and this is what's going to give me meaning, and this is what's going to give me fulfillment. Changes. All that becomes replaced by my relationship with Christ and the blessings that flow out of that. And what occurs in that transformation as I'm pressing ahead toward the mark of the high calling in Jesus. Our definition of what is valuable changes. Our identity shifts. And the things that we used to think were the most important things in the world are now dung. And then we become that person who's able to look at other people and freely give and freely serve and freely minister and think of in different ways. I'm going to conclude with one more scripture. And that's Matthew 16, 25. Everybody listen to this. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. This is, of course, a statement of Jesus to his disciples. My question is, do we really believe it? Because this is a statement of surrender and submission. Plain and simple. If you're going to find your life, meaning eternally, but not just eternally. If you're going to find your life like Paul, meaning something differently, rearranged to use your gifts, resources, and talents in a different way, Rearrange to give God the glory in your relationships and all that you do. Rearrange so that you can become others focused to serve and to help and to minister. If you're going to find your life, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to find that life one day, that with all that meaning, with all of that purpose, you've got to lose it. That's surrender. You've got to completely surrender all. But if you're going to find your life here, if you're going to be like the rich young man, and you're going to say, well... I see some value in in this thing, Jesus, but there's some things that I really hold dear that I want to keep that will come in conflict with really surrendering all. and, And those things will have some value secularly. Those things will bring some benefit to us here. Let's not, you know, gloss over that. And they can bring some fulfillment. And it but but in 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 light of eternity, in light of of, of all of what Jesus is saying, they, it, it, they, we're going to lose it because we refuse to give it up now. And so that's why surrender is so challenging, but also why it's at the core of our decision on what we're going to do with our life about following Jesus. So if we want to save our life, save it, we've got to surrender it. And then we'll be raised and Christ will work in us 
And who knows what that's going to be and who knows what that's going to look like. Surrender all. Submission. Not easy. But God's will. As we sing this song, I pray that if anything the word has said has touched your heart, that you'll open it up and let God work on it. You know, not, it's, none of us really going to have quite as dramatic uh, uh, situations in encountering Jesus face to face like both Paul and the young man did. But yet, we're going to encounter Jesus. And so I hope that we're able to surrender now so that we can redefine who we are and see the joy and the blessings in everything that Christ is asking because that really that that is really where the joy and the blessings are we're going to have some shepherds up here if you need to come I pray that you will while we stand and sing